people, recipient in 1999 of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, and also John D. Rockefeller, Jr., professor at Rockefeller University in New York City. The Nobel Committee recognized Dr. Blobel for the insights that he and his students accumulated over a couple of decades that told us about the built-in information that directs a protein molecule to its intended destination in the cell. Each protein has an address label, either at one end, his original idea almost just about 30 years ago, or found among the many twisting bumps and crevices on a protein surface. This kind of molecular zip code helps the protein wend its way through the tunnels that move through the cell's interior. The protein may need to insert into a membrane, as Dr. Fisher has shown us, or join other molecules in the power-generating mitochondria, or the light-capturing chloroplast. Beside, despite the pashawing of other cell biologists, Dr. Blobel found channels constructed by protein molecules that other proteins use as a conduit to move through the oily interior of internal membranes. He has also studied the protein-lined pores that perforate the two membranes that, in turn, enclose the nuclear material, channels through which one million molecules pass each second. There's kind of an irony in this, uh, kind of an irony in here. When Dr. Blobel arrived at the Twin City Airport, his luggage didn't arrive at the correct destination, despite the barcode label that was intended to direct the luggage to the appropriate carousel. He was born in a small farming town in Silesia, Germany, the son of a veterinarian. As World War II drew to a close, the advances of the Russian army forced the family to flee further west into Germany. On the trek, Dr. Blobel and his family watched as Allied bombs leveled Dresden, that once great city of splendorous architecture. As a young man in what was then East Germany, Dr. Blobel changed his address to West Germany so that he could continue his studies. He said that he had, was able to do that before the Berlin Wall had been put up to keep people like him from moving. After completing a medical degree at the University of Tübingen and a stint as a medical intern, he felt restrained as a medical practitioner because he was handling only symptoms and not the molecular reasons for a disease. And so he attempted to find funding to support a graduate degree in Europe, but was not successful either, even unsuccessful in the Fulbright, but had a brother, has a brother who at that time was on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin, and so his brother encouraged him to go to the University of Wisconsin. Well, Europe's loss, the United States gain. At the University of Wisconsin, he completed a PhD in the study of cancer oncology, and then moved to, the, to Rockefeller University, where he worked in the lab uh, as a postdoc in the lab of Dr. George Pallada, who was the later to become also a Nobel laureate, sort of as we heard from uh, Professor Norby, Nobel laureates beget Nobel laureates. And it was in this time that, after, as a result probably of Dr. Pallada's interest in the traffic of proteins, that Dr. Blobel figured out how proteins know where to go. He's a very generous person. He donated some of the money that accompanies the Nobel Prize to an international foundation that is raising $200 million to reconstruct the Frauenkirche, the Protestant Church of Our Lady in Dresden, which you'll see up here on the two slides, the original uh, Frauenkirche. He also donated money, the, uh, some of this money from the Nobel Prize for rebuilding a Dresden synagogue that had been burned by the Nazis in 1939. The prize money that came from the King Faisal Award, another award in his, um, the awards that Dr. Blobel has received, also went to the Dresden Foundation. The money that he's donating is going to the American wing of that um, re reconstructed cathedral. And at breakfast this morning, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but at breakfast this morning, Dr. Blobel told us that the honorarium for his contributions to this conference will be given to reconstruction of a 7th century mosque in Yemen. And so we look forward to... We look forward to hearing about your studies on these 
repeat these informational molecules that a cell uses for destinations and what lies ahead. Thank Dr. Global. Thank you, John. Uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, the organizers of this meeting, particular uh, Professor Steuer, for inviting me. And um, it's one of the great meetings I have attended. The organization is just flawless, and uh, uh, it has been two wonderful days. And I would like to thank everybody here from from the little choristers last night and the Noble Symphony to uh, to the slide projections. Uh, it has always been very perfect. Now, I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to give a talk about Dresden, also I like to talk about it. I just wanted to point out that this is probably the Frauenkirche, is one of the most um, imposing buildings north of the Alps, and by many considered one of the most important. And what you see here is not just a, a half sphere as a cupola, but it's a bell. The, 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 the entire church is in form of a stone bell, which is about 100 meters high, and, and therefore dominated the Dresden skyline and was, of course, painted by numerous painters, and is really the, the determining feature of the Dresden skyline. And it's up to here. It's now built up to this point. It's, the inside is round, and it's um, very high, and it has five tiers. It's almost like an opera house. And it has, of course, a very good acoustic, and we are right here now, and in four years we will be finished. There's still uh, 60 million, uh, 30 million dollars missing. So if anybody of you has a lot of money, uh, get, in, get in touch with me, and um, something will, will be built that will hopefully last uh, uh, for a long time to come. So we have heard a lot about um, proteins today, and uh, the previous speakers have introduced the subject. We have heard about one, one protein uh, that is um, uh, the prion protein that uh, Stanley Pusiner described, and we have seen the complications uh, engendered by one single protein and how little we know about this one little protein. And now we have many, many, uh, Edmund Fisher mentioned maybe a million different proteins in the cell. Um, so we are facing a tremendous uh, challenge. The term proteomics has been coined as we discussed. Um, I think, you know, the next term it will be cellomics, cellomics, you know, the, the various cells that we find uh, in, in the living universe. As you, as you know, uh, the cell uh, arose uh, th some 3.5 billion years ago. Um, it took about 1.5 billion years, Earth is 5 billion years old, it took about 1.5 billion years to develop a cell. Nobody knows how the cell came about. But what is very uh, interesting uh, is that the cell has divided ever since. Of course, it has changed dramatically. But certain features of the cell that, we are, that arose 3.5 billion years ago uh, are still present. Uh, for instance, the membrane which surrounds the cell is probably very similar to than the membrane that we had um, 3.5 billion years ago. It's a bilayer of lipid molecules, and I will come back to that. So the really wonderful thing is that these cells have divided ever since. And you, of course, are a product of this cell division and cell association. So from a cellular point of view, you are 3.5 billion years old of continuous cell division. Think about it, your mother, your grandfather, you came from a cell, and at some point these cells lived in animals, and they live in plants, and they wear bacteria. And this, this is this wonderful relationship uh, between our life. And this is not, this inside is not very old. It's about 100 years old. When a German pathologist Virchow postulated in the 1870s that uh, omnis cellula a cellula, he said it in Latin, each cell comes from a pre-existing cell. Before people thought that cells can come from some um, secreted substances and you can form extracellular, you can put together from, a, from secreted substances a cell. And we now know that this, of course, is uh, not um, possible. And so that we all have adopted cellu omnis cellula a cellula 
each uh, cell comes from a pre-existing cell. And so as you are sitting here, you are from a cellular point of view 3.5 billion years old. Now let me tell you a bit more about cells in general before I go into my own this specific um, 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 topic. And I wanted to show you here an egg cell, and you can see this huge egg cell. And um, it is being, uh, in the, it's a, there's a sperm that uh, has come in with its long tail. You can see the long tail here. And this is a sperm head where the genetic material is. And you can see how insignificant the sperm looks by comparison to the egg cell. As you know, the mitochondria, which give you the power, the ATP, and we have heard about ATP, it comes from the mother. So you inherit the uh, mitochondria from the mother. There is literally no mitochondria which add in the fertilization. And this is how you start out life. You start out life as a single cell, and from then on you undergo a number of divisions, uh, about 10 divisions or so, even less, and you form a little blastocyst, which is not bigger than this egg cell. And the blastocyst is um, a little hole uh, uh, which is surrounded by cells and it, it uh, is a little vesicle, I would say, surrounded by cells. And there is a little cell mass in there. I should actually have a picture of that. And that um, are the so-called embryonic stem cells. And uh, we will talk a bit later about embryonic stem cells. Of course, these are very important cells because they are uh, uh, totally potent, that is, these uh, cells can develop into any cells in our, in our body, but they cannot form another embryo, because the cells that are required for that are part of this uh, vesicle. So you see this, and in the next slide you see this a little bit more close up, you see these many villi here, and you see the tail of the sperm here, and you see how the sperm head has, the membrane of the sperm head has fused with the plasma membrane of the egg cell. And then what happens is um, there are only about 50 divisions necessary to form a human body, only 50, which you calculate it. It's several hundred trillion cells in our body. And this, uh, these cells then specialize, and here is a, a bunch of blood cells, and you see the red cells here, which look like pennies, and then there are white cells, which look completely different. They have these ruffles on the surface. And here you see something which is very striking. You see a normal red cell, and you see a sickle cell. And all that happened in the sickle cell is that the globin molecule, which is a protein in these uh, red blood cells, uh, has one amino acid changed out of 170 or so uh, that is changed into another amino acid. And this one single mutation causes the cell to change shape. The globin actually is, is not uh, losing its capacity to do its work, but it changes the shape of the cell into this sickle-like uh, shape, and these sickle-shaped cells cannot navigate through the very narrow capillaries in the brains elsewhere, elsewhere in the body, and therefore they are mechanically prone to destruction. And so these people who have this disease, sickle cell anemia, uh, have, um, uh, um, uh, have an anemia. They, they, they cannot make uh, as many uh, red cells as are being destroyed uh, constantly, or they just make a bit more than are being destroyed constantly. Of course, this mutation was a very useful one once in this globin molecule because it protected the people who had this mutation from infection by the malaria agent. The malaria is a single cell and it has to attach to the uh, red cell and has to be uh, invaginated to enter the cell. And these sickle cells are much less effective in uh, taking up the malaria, uh, uh, this malaria cell in the plasmodium, as it is called. And therefore, these people who had these mutations survived better uh, in the population because they weren't prone to malaria infection. So this is just a little a story uh, to telling you uh, what, how important a one single protein can be and what, uh, what advantages you may have from a mutation and what disadvantages you may have from a mutation. Now here you have cancer cell and on the surface they don't look that much different. If you look at cancer cells they just grow on top of each other and they don't look that much different. And here you have a neuron with its many um, uh, dendrites and um, there are each of these dendrites you can see 
little uh, uh, buttons, and each of these little buttons connect to another nerve cell. So each of these nerve cells may have 10,000 connections to other nerve cells. And there are more synapses, uh, it is said, in the nervous system than there are stars in the universe. So it uh, tells you something about the complexity of the human brain. Here is another way of showing uh, these cells, uh, these nerve cells, with these many little dendrites and the leni many little buttons, as they are called, buttons, which connect to other cells. And here is, on the head of a needle, uh, is a bacterium. You can see the needle a little bit enlarged. This is just a needle, a little pin that you would have in your suit. And you can see the bacteria here, and you can see them here more enlarged. And here you can see them very much enlarged. And again, they, they are very similar uh, uh, to, to cells, uh, to our cells. They have a membrane surrounding the cell. And they have, of course, some other features which I won't go into. But it's, it, the, the bacterial cells were the first cells that were made. That, that arose 3.5 billion years ago, and um, this so-called archibacteria. And it is from there that these cells then have developed and uh, have uh, got, gone into uh, becoming uh, eukaryotic cells. So this is just um, giving you an idea in what environment proteins operate, namely in the framework of a cell. And now, each time I go, I'm going to go a bit more. The beautiful pictures will end, and it's going to be a bit more challenging. So we'll probably lose at each step as I go along 10% of my audience. And then at the end, I will show you some unpublished data, and I will only probably keep 2 or 3% of the audience. But I, I thought it would be nice to have something for everyone. So this is the easy part. Now, you have already heard today about membranes. And um, uh, membranes were briefly mentioned, but I think it's very important that you understand that membranes are made of lipid molecules. And lipid molecules have oily tails, and they have a water-loving head, a hydrophilic head. And cholesterol, the dreadful cholesterol, which everybody dreads, is also one of these uh, lipids. And it has a similar, uh, it has also a water loving head and then a slightly different hydrophobic tail. And these two get together and form a bilayer, a, a lipid bilayer. And this is the fundamental organization of all membranes. You can see here the lipid molecule. There is the water-loving head face on one side and the water-loving head on the other side. And in the center of this bilayer, you have these hydrophobic, uh, um, uh, water-repelling um, um, tails of these lipid molecules. And um, so nothing could potentially go through these lipid bilayers. They are a magnificent seal that nature has invented to seal the cell off from the environment. But uh, if you couldn't communicate with the environment, you, it wouldn't be any good. Uh, and so what has uh, been done is proteins have been weaved in to these uh, lipid bilayers, and uh, they, um, they uh, span the bilayers and they form channels, for instance, for ions or even for water. Water doesn't get across spontaneously. It needs a channel, or it gets across very slowly. But to, uh, to do it faster, it, you, need, you need a channel. And then, of course, we have heard from, uh, from Edmund Fisher um, uh, about, about the many receptors, for instance, the insulin receptor. And what is very important is that these membrane proteins are all a given membrane protein. Let's suppose a receptor that Edmund Fisher discussed today always has the same orientation in the membrane. There has to be complete asymmetry of a given membrane protein. And one of the big questions was, how do you achieve this absolute symmetry for a given membrane protein? And I will tell you what the solution is a, a bit later on. Now, you can see when electron microscopy was really used to look at cells, and this happened at about the same time when Dresden was destroyed, in February 1945. The first paper was published by Keith Porter, Albert Claude, and Ernest Fulham from the Rockefeller University, and they used the electron microscope to look at cells and what the cells looked like. For hundreds of years, people have stared through the light microscope and didn't see much than a membrane and a nucleus. And if they used certain stains, they saw several other spots in the cell, but they couldn't really see. And what the electron microscope showed for the first time, that there are here the nucleus, which people had seen in the light microscope, is big enough to see it in the center. But you see many, many, many membrane compartments. The cell is chock full of membranes. So you could, there are some cells which are 
50 or 60 percent of the proteins will be membrane proteins, proteins that are woven in, into the membrane. And so these, these uh, tremendous number of membranes, they signify various compartments of the cell. So there are mitochondria, I will show you in the, let's, in the next slide, a bit more uh, um, schematic. Here you have the nucleus, and um, the uh, nucleus has pores in their double envelope membrane, and these pores are important for traffic between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. And um, I will talk a little bit towards the end of my talk about this traffic. There's about one million uh, proteins and RNA molecules which per minute go in and out of the nucleus. So there's a tremendous traffic going on. And this traffic is very, very important for another uh, um, important finding uh, that, that I will come back to later on. But here in pink, you see these pink uh, structures. These are the mitochondria, and they have numerous membranes. And uh, on these membranes, ATP, the universal currency of energy, is produced in large quantities. And uh, so these, these are the mitochondria, and there are many other organelles that I won't go and won't have time to describe you. But what you can see that the cell is really chock full of membranes. Now, in the nucleus, you have the chromosomes, you have the DNA that you all are familiar with and that you have heard of. Now, here what I'm showing you is a single chromosome. It's a human chromosome, and we have in our cells 23 pairs of chromosomes. And you take a piece of DNA, each chromosome has one molecule of DNA. And it is very compact. If you take the human DNA and, 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 and look at the thin fiber, it is two meters long. And if you take all, all DNA from our cells, you go back and forth to the sun 300 times. So this is how thin this thread is. And the art now is to compact this thread in such a way that you can still make it accessible to machines which copy part of this thread and which do uh, modify the DNA. And here is the most condensed form of the DNA in the chromatin, and this is done when you divide the cell and you want to distribute the chromosomes into daughter cells. You need to have them very compact, otherwise you would entangle the DNA and you, you could never untangle it again. So you have to compact it. Then, when cell division is over, you, you, uh, you expand the DNA again, and you expand only specific portion, depending on what cell type it is. You want to only play certain portion in the liver cell, you play another portion of the DNA, then you play in a, in a, in a pancreas cell or whatever. So, so each the portions then uh, expand. And, and here what has been done is an agent has been added to this chromosome and you now can see that the proteins, the DNA is rolled around a protein um, the complex. The proteins have been removed and you now can see that the DNA, here you can see, still, still see the chromosome. You can see the skeletal network of the chromosome and you can see that the DNA has now spilled out in this tremendous long thread. And here I'm showing you um, a, magnif a magnification of this and you can see this thread of the DNA. This is now without proteins, this is just naked DNA. And this DNA, of course, as you have heard and all read, consists of four letters. So the, so the uh, language is a four-letter language. And so the, the sequence of these letters in these very long molecules has now been established. We know this now. Okay, um, now here I'm showing you some images of how the DNA is transcribed in messenger RNA molecules which leave the nucleus and get out of the nucleus. And you see these beautiful structures where the transcription starts here at one end, for instance, you see very small molecules of RNA. They become longer and longer and longer. So they are the so-called Christmas tree structures. So you can see that the, mole the enzyme molecules when transcribe the RNA into messenger RNA. And this is a very nice visualization. So the DNA then is transcribed to these messenger RNA molecules or to other RNA molecules, and then it leaves the nucleus to go to the cytoplasm. And there it is translated by one of the most complex machineries that nature has, in, has, has invented, and that is the ribosome. The ribosome, and I will show you some images, the X-ray structure of bacterial ribosomes has just been published. And I will show you some images later on, on, the, on eukaryotic ribosomes. But you then translate a four-letter 
language into a 20-letter language. And there is really a three-letter code that goes into a, 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 one of the letters of the 20-letter uh, uh, alphabet. And um, the proteins are usually um, uh, in the order of 400 or 500 of these, of these amino acids long, but there are some which are much longer and some of them which are sm much shorter. Our words in English on the average are about seven letters, so the proteins have many more letters and therefore can do many, many more things. And you have already heard about what they can do in, in during the day's lecture. Now here is uh, uh, George Palladi was already mentioned um, uh, before and he it started to, to, he was one of the pioneers in electron microscopy and he discovered many structures in the cell and he worked out what is known as the secretory pathway. And I'm showing you here the secretory pathway. Um, these are, um, is the so-called endoplasmic reticulum. This is one of the membranes that was discovered in 1945 when Keith Porter looked at the cell. And he called these endoplasmic reticulum membranes. They looked like a reticulum. And so the name stuck. And what was then found that these endoplasmic reticulum membranes have ribosomes attached to them. And you already know that the ribosomes translate the messenger RNA and make protein out of it. And what Pallada had found is, and, and for this work he got the Nobel Prize, is that uh, proteins like insulin or growth hormone, secretory proteins, are made on ribosomes that are membrane bound and then he has traced back the pathway of these proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum all the way out of the cell. And this pathway is called the Pallada pathway or the secretory pathway. So what happens is that the proteins, while they're synthesized, while they're translated by the messenger RNA on these ribosomes, and I'm not showing you the messenger RNA, they are getting somehow across the membrane. It wasn't known how. And then they are packaged up in little vesicles, little containers, and these vesicles fuse with downstream compartments, uh, and then in downstream compartments sit many enzymes, and the enzymes modify the protein. They put on sugar molecules, and they do all sorts of other things. So it's very much like in the car assembly plant. You have made just the carrossery, and as you go through these various compartments, you put on other things to really make the, the fold the protein properly. You make all sorts of other bonds to it. And we have heard some of, uh, uh, some of the um, enzymes already were discussed this morning, also they are not in this compartment really. Um, and then eventually a vesicle takes a quantum of secretory proteins and fuses with the plasma membrane, and this is how the secretory protein gets out. And so when I started in Pallada's lab as a, as a postdoctor fellow, I was interested in the rather mundane question of why do messenger RNAs for secretory proteins know that they have to be translated on these membrane-bound ribosomes? Because there are many ribosomes in the cell free, and why do they go to these membrane-bound ribosomes? It's a very fairly straight, a trivial question. And um, well, there were many hypotheses. I won't t take you back into, into history, but an idea that we came up with with David Sabatini, and here's his image in 1970, was a very simple one, but uh, even so, there was absolutely no evidence for it. And the idea that we proposed is that all nascent polypeptide chains that are made, here's a messenger RNA, here's one end, the five prime end of the messenger RNA, and here's the three prime end of the messenger RNA. And what happens is that first the small ribosomal subunit binds, and then the large ribosomal subunit binds, and then you have translation uh, from, from, the, from the messenger RNA into the polypeptide chain. And what we postulated is that the polypeptide chain at the end has uh, X has a couple of amino uh, acids which are unique to all secretory proteins and that sequence uh, is then recognized by a binding factor which binds the translating ribosome to the membrane which is indicated here in this arch and then somehow it gets across the membrane we didn't speculate any further at this point it was already enough speculation and then the proteins get somehow across the membrane then the ribosome comes off the membrane recycles goes into a subunit pool and then the entire process starts again from the beginning. And so, uh, uh, so this is um, uh, what we call signal hypothesis because what we said there is the information is 
in the messenger RNA, but is translated into a sequence of amino acids at the amino terminus of the protein, and that then recruits binding factors and other things in the membrane that we didn't spell out that then gets the protein across the membrane. A bit later, we added something to, the, to this whole idea, namely that there is a channel, a protein-conducting channel in the membrane that consists of proteins itself, and what we postulated is that the signal sequence acts like a ligand to open the channel, and the ribosome helps in it too. There are attachment sites on the ribosome to this proteins, to these proteins. We have indicated here a trimer, this was in 1975, um, uh, of, of membrane proteins which are recruited from the membrane to form this aqueous channel so that, that the protein can go across. The reason why we did this very complicated scheme is because we wanted to keep the membrane insoluble, impermeable for other things because it turns out that on the other side of the endoplasmic reticulum membrane there are very high concentrations of calcium, for instance, and you don't want to have the calcium to leak out into the cytoplasm. It would be a disaster. And so we wanted to have this channel only to conduct nascent chains, nascent polypeptide chains, nascent unfolded proteins across. So we attached a little signal sequence at the amino terminus, which acts a key together with the ribosome to open the channel. Sounded all wonderful, but it was sheer fantasy. And of course, uh, as all fantasies uh, undergo severe criticisms, which is only right. And um, uh, it, it, it took us quite a while to, to actually come up um, uh, with evidence for this scheme. Now, the first bit of evidence which we obtained was together with a postdoctoral fellow, with Bernhard Doberstein. We were able to set up a cell-free system, as it is called, where you take the cell, you grind it down, and you isolate various components, and you try to put it back together. This is an old strategy that is being done in, 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 uh, in, re in cell biology research. And so what we did essentially, we isolated messenger RNA for, for a secretory protein, we took some ribosomes and we isolated some membranes and we were in fact able, after trying for two years, we were able to reconstitute the whole thing. So that in the selfie system, in a little test tube, this process, this very complicated process could be repeated. Now once you're able to do that, then you can analyze it. We were hearing from from Stanley today, that one person was asking the question, can you reconstitute in a cell-free system the conversion of the prion protein into an insoluble prion protein? Can you do it with isolated protein in the test tube? And you can't do it that yet in this case. It would be wonderful if we could do it because then we can learn what is going on. We were able to do it in this case and this then led over a period of 15 years to tremendous new insights and to tremendous new discoveries, which I will go through with you. Now, this is Peter Walter, who made the first discovery, and I asked him to send me a picture, and he was obviously in, stimulated by Einstein. Um, also, when, when, when um, Harry Croto showed the young Einstein picture, there wasn't any tongue hanging out, but you, you, you remember the famous Einstein picture. And so Peter was able to isolate what we, had post, what we had postulated before, namely that there is a binding factor which recognizes this signal sequence. And it turned out that this binding factor was un, uh, unexpectedly complicated. It consisted of an RNA molecule and of six proteins which were uh, binding to this RNA molecule, and uh, this um, we call the signal recognition particle because it functions, as we had postulated, in recognizing the signal sequence on the translating ribosome and to mediate the attachment of the translating ribosome to the membrane. But we know that it attaches only to the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, not to the mitochondrial membrane, not to the Golgi membrane, not to the plasma membrane. So there had to be in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane a receptor which recognized the SRP. So we postulate the existence of an SRP receptor. And um, just before I show you how we isolated this, I just show you that the SRP, which you see here, binds, in fact, to the signal sequence as it emerges, this nascent chain to 
electrode versus the large ribosomal subunit, and the signal sequence is then recognized by one of the proteins, which turns out to be a G protein, of the signal recognition particle. So this complex must then bind specifically to the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, and there has to be a receptor. And this receptor was isolated by Reed Gilmore together with Peter Walter when he was a postdoc in our lab, and the SRP receptor turns out to be a, a dimer, heterodimer, also two G proteins. So there are three G proteins involved in recognition of the signal sequence, one in the SRP, and in targeting it to the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. It turns out that this SRP receptor is exclusively localized in the endoplasmic reticulum and in no other membrane. So this very complicated process of signal sequence recognition and targeting by these components gets the chain, uh, the secretory protein to the endoplasmic reticulum. So this we understood at this point. And here's just a summary. So we have now bound the translating ribosome with the um, SRP to the um, um, SRP receptor in the membrane. Now, the next um, experiments where is there a channel? Um, there were many other models. You could imagine that uh, there were models like the hydrophobic signal sequence partitions into the bilayer, and then uh, uh, the, the free energy which you get from that is enough to get the rest of the chain across, and you don't need a protein conducting channel. And Sandy Simon, by electrophysiology, and I won't show you uh, the experiment that he done there, very, very beautiful, but very complicated, uh, then found a, 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 the fact, it found that there is a protein conducting channel, and the other work in other laboratories particularly in Randy Shackman's lab, then isolated such a protein con a conducting channel. And we now know what it looks like. Uh, he has indicated the protein conducting channel. It's called in the um, language of yeast SAC61. And uh, so what then happens is when the, the, through a number of GTPase events, the signal sequence, the SRP comes off from the signal sequence. The signal sequence is now free to interact directly with the channel and it, it opens the channel and the ribosome attaches to the channel and now the chain can go across an aqueous environment. Now there are some other enzymes which are recruited to this uh, channel ensemble which work while the chain is going across the membrane. There is an enzyme called signal peptidase here in blue which cleaves off the signal sequence because you don't need it anymore. And there are other, many other enzymes, I've indicated just one of them, which is recruited to this entire complex, which puts sugar molecules uh, on this nascent chain as it goes across. Now, Emily Evans was a graduate student who purified the signal peptidase, which was a very um, arduous work and uh, very difficult to do, and she succeeded. And I just wanted to show that we also were able eventually to isolate some of the other components. And what I wanted to show you here is um, if I can, is a cartoon. Now it disappeared from my screen. We have to wait what happens. Which summarizes this whole thing, the whole 25 years in an animated cartoon, um, which lasts about three minutes. It's very humbling if you can do that. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And remember, you just come home. It's no longer on my screen. I'm right here. Okay. All right, so, so I, I do it here, okay. Now, you have this small ribosomal subunit. You have a tRNA, which brings in the first amino acid attached and the messenger RNA. They bind first and they form this complex. This is work that others have done that we have not contributed to. Then uh, you get the large subunit to join, the large ribosomal subunit. It's here and it's joined and it, uh, it, it, it binds to the small ribosomal subunit. Then more tRNA molecules come and this chain then has to traverse the large ribosomal subunit and um, you, you form, we rotate the ribosome now, you see the small ribosomal subunit in yellow, the large ribosomal subunit here, 
And uh, you see now a ballet of tRNA which delivers each one an amino acid so that the chain grows by one amino acid at a time. And the colors indicate that each tRNA carries another amino acid. And eventually you will see down here after this ballet is finished, the one who did the animation liked this tRNA ballet so it goes on for a little bit too long. But in any case, um, you can see that eventually there's energy uh, utilized. So you see a little flash here. Um, GTP is hydrolyzed, you see a little flash, and eventually um, the chain will come out uh, of the large ribosomal subunit. There is a tunnel in the large ribosomal subunit through which the chain goes. And here the signal sequence has come out, and it's now available to bind. Sorry, now I screwed up. Um, <coughs> I have to go back. Um, and now advance this very fast because I don't want you to take you to the same uh, sequence again. Um, go forward here and don't go, go on fast. Um, here, we have seen this already. We have seen that part. We have seen the tRNA ballet. We have seen the chain coming out. And now comes the uh, signal recognition particle up here, which joins and recognizes the signal sequence down here and binds. And then comes uh, this whole ensemble is then bound to the SRP receptor, and the SRP receptor collides with the channel. And then what happens then is that the channel is opened by the signal sequence, and the ribosome attaches to it. Channel is opened, and then uh, you you. Um, uh, start continue the trans, uh, translation and the chain is growing and signal peptidase has come and has cleaved off the signal sequence oligosaccharidal transferase which puts on the sugars puts on the sugar the chain gets across and finally it is completely across the membrane the channel closes the ribosome comes off now this took us 25 years <laughs> you, may, you may you may say why why did it take so long but anyway what what the interesting thing was that there are many other compartments in the cell which use essentially identical mechanisms. They have a signal sequence, of course it's different. It is a different zip code because you want to go to a different compartment. And they have signal recognition factors and they have channels. And all of these were subsequently discovered in other systems, either in our lab or in other laboratories. <clears throat> so this gives you a, a good idea um, and now let's go on. There is a very important thing that Vishul Ngapa, a graduate student, discovered, and that I mentioned already in the beginning, namely membrane proteins. How does a chain weave itself into the membrane? And the idea was simply that they fold itself into the lipid bilayer. They have somehow the information. You make the chain in the cytoplasm, and then the polypeptide chain folds itself into the membrane. And this didn't sound reasonable, so what we postulated, and this is what Vishal and Gappa has proven, and I think this is a very important finding, is that um, uh, membrane proteins have a signal sequence, undistinguishable from secretory proteins, have a signal, which addresses them to the membrane of the arm, not showing all the components anymore. And then what happens, the channel is opened, and part of the protein goes across to the other side. But integral membrane proteins have an additional element, sequence element, which we have called the stop transfer sequence, which is able to open this protein conducting channel laterally to the lipid bilayer so that this little segment, the transmembrane segment, can come out through this opening and get stuck in the bilayer and the rest of the chain is then remaining in the cytoplasm. And if you saw Edmund Fisher's talk this morning, and you have seen all the receptors, there's always a portion that is on the outside of the cell which corresponds to this portion that has been translocated, and there's a portion that spans the membrane, and this is this portion, and there's a portion that remains in the cytoplasm. And it is by this sequence information in these membrane proteins that you stitch the membrane proteins into the membrane exactly for a given protein species as, as as the protein really dictates it to this machinery, and the machinery just interprets this um, uh, information in the nascent chain. And this is unique, this protein conducting channel, because it can open across the membrane, and it can, uh, it can also open in the second dimension to the lipid bilayer. 
Now, we'll show you some low-resolution images later on. Now, here we come to Roland Beckman. And uh, seeing is believing, and we wanted to see this channel. What does this channel look like? And in the course of doing so, uh, he worked together with um, Christian Spahn from, from Joachim Frank's laboratory in Albany. And they, uh, they did some very beautiful work that is going to be published in a month from now in Cell. And this is the part that I will probably lose most of the audience, but um, the 5% of the audience which can follow this will probably enjoy it. What they did is they did a technique that has been invented a couple of years ago where you take a specimen and you rapidly freeze it in ice so that there are no crystals formed and you get what is called vitreous ice. And so then you take an electron beam and you look at the structure and you look at density difference between water and your protein molecule. And proteins usually have a density of 1.28 or whatever. And, and, and RNA molecules, of course, are much denser. They are about 1.6. And so they looked at the ribosome, the mammalian ribosome. And um, in the meantime, this is an E. coli ribosome, a bacterial ribosome, and a mammalian ribosome, which is much larger. Um, the mammalian ribosome, or this in this case it's from yeast, the eukaryotic ribosome is 80S and the, um, the bacterial ribosome is 70S and there's a small subunit and the large subunit. And the, the green, the, the green uh, molecule there is a tRNA molecule that is, that is in this case sitting between the two subunits. And this is at a resolution of 11 angstrom and this is at a resolution of 15 angstrom. So the surface features here are much cruder than they are here. But what you can see is, what we have shown here is that, that the, the eukaryotic large ribosomal subunit and small ribosomal subunit have these dark regions or these purple regions attached to them. And what we found is that the eukaryotic large subunit and small subunit are exactly as the prokaryotic, as the bacterial small subunit in, its, in their structure. All what they have done is they have added additional RNA segments, which are all found on their surface in evolution. In these 3.5 billion years of evolution, you have just made the ribosome more complicated, and you added more RNA segments and more proteins, and they're all found on the surface. You see in purple here, they're all found on the surface, and in yellow here on the surface of the small ribosome. And he has just tilted the whole thing by 90 degrees so that you see both surfaces, and you see they are, in fact, in clusters on the surface. Here we have taken the small and the large subunit apart, and you see the peptidyl tRNA moiety, and here this is the small subunit, and this is exactly in the interface between the small and the large ribosomal subunit, and here you can see again in purple is the uh, eukaryotic ribosome with all its additional uh, RNA segments and protein segments which are not present in the prokaryotic ribosome. And here, uh, you may not be able to see it, but here are these so-called expansion segments of the small ribosomal subunit indicated in red. So the basic structure of the RNA, of the ribosomal RNA, is still the same. What is different here is there are these expansion segments, these loops, and they're indicated in red. And this is what you have then uh, in the small ribosomal subunit. We have then taken the RNA uh, of the bacterial RNA of the small ribosomal subunit and fitted it into, because you can separate the densities of RNA from protein in these images, because the RNA density is 1.6 and the protein density is 1.28. So you can separate the densities and you can fit in the bacterial RNA structure from the X-ray structure into these, into these densities. And you see that there are certain regions here and here that, uh, that, are, that are not present in the bacterial uh, ribosome. And it is those regions which have the expansion segments. So here, for instance, you have an expansion segment here, you have another one. This is unfortunately a mistake. It should be yellow up to down here. And there is another expansion segment here, and it's just rotated. So they're all on the surface. And uh, then we have been able to fit in the protein uh, X-ray structures that are known into the protein densities. And see, we have been very successful of, uh, in the ribbon model, if it's only a 15 angstrom resolution, uh, to fit in into these densities um, the, the protein molecules. And um, you will say, well, why do you do this exercise? Maybe in 20 years we have, we have uh, crystal structures of eukaryotic ribosomes, and then this is all superfluous. But it will probably take a long time to get crystal structures of eukaryotic ribosome, but one never knows. So we now have some structures 
structure that tells us a, a little bit before we have the X-ray structure. And here's the same exercise with the large ribosomal subit. In red, you see all these extra segments that you find in eukaryotic and the eukaryotic large ribosomal subunit. And here we have fitted in the prokaryotic RNA, and you can see the many empty spots here uh, are the extension, expansion segments that are filled in in color here um, by the expansion segments that are present in the eukaryotic RNA. And then we have done the same thing with protein. We have fitted in the protein uh, models uh, in this way. Now the next, so this, this is really a, a tremendous advance in, 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 uh, in the structure of this most complicated machine that nature has developed, namely the, um, the uh, ribosome which translates the messenger on into proteins. Now the next question that we were interested in, and this is also, it will be in another paper published in Cell next month, is the channel. We have isolated the channel from the membranes and we have bound it back to a ribosome which contains a nascent chain with a tRNA still in it. And you can see the peptidyl tRNA here in green. You cannot see the chain because it's the resolution is not high enough. And then we have bound the protein conducting channel to it. And you can see here's a small sub and the large sub and here's a protein conducting channel attached. Now we have rotated this a little bit so that you can see the channel from the bottom side in the large ribosomal subunit. And here you see an inactive ribosome where there is no um, uh, peptidyl tRNA, and you can see an empty spot up here, um, and it's channels, the channel still binds. Uh, but if you look at the conformational changes that the channel has undergone, you can see an oblongated channel binding to an empty ribosome. And as the channel is penetrated by the nascent chain, it rounds up and becomes thicker. And so there are tremendous conformational changes that take place when the chain uh, it goes through the protein conducting channel. Now here is a cut through these images and you can see the large subunit, the small subunit, the peptidyl tRNA. Of course you don't see the nascent chain, it's just indicated here. And here you see the channel and you see the various attachment sites of the channel to the large ribosomal subunit. What is very ex interesting is that the channel is rather compact we don't see a big hole in the channel. And this is the, the miracle of this channel design because it is designed to, to sort of cuddle the nascent chain as it goes across and, 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 and not allow any other ions to go across or anything else across. So it's very specifically designed to let the nascent chain in an, in an unfolded configuration get across the membrane. Now what we also found is something interesting. When the uh, SEC61, the channel binds, this particular segment of RNA, it's a huge RNA helix, swings over by 90 degree to get out of the channel, of the channel exit side where the chain comes out. This little dimple here is the side where the chain exits the large ribosomal subunit. And this helix of RNA is protecting this exit side. Now when you bind the channel, this helix moves by 90 degree parallel to the small subunit binding side. And you can see this here. And now freeze the, um, freeze the, uh, the side, in this case, for binding of the channel. So there are huge conformational changes that you couldn't see in, a, in a, a crystal structure unless you have a crystal structure of an empty ribosome and a crystal structure with the membrane protein SEC61, and this is not very likely to occur very soon. And here is going into more details and analyzing what the connections are, and I won't go and bother you with this, but just uh, you know, the enormous amount of information that you can get. We have been exactly able to identify which of the large ribosomal proteins, um, RPL19 for instance, and which residues, for instance, proline 25 to threonine 48, interacts with what helix um, uh, of the RNA, and so on. So we have been able to do really some molecular dissection. And so this, uh, this channel interacts both with RNA, ribosomal RNA, and with ribosomal proteins. We have also then fitted in the alpha helices in this channel, and it turns out that three 661 oligomers form this channel. So it's very much like what we had drawn as a fantasy cartoon in 1975, 20 years earlier, that there may be three summons. Of course, it's entirely luck. Um, um, and um, <clears throat> anyway, so now in the last five minutes or so, I would like to talk yet about another of these public protein translocation systems. The system that I just discussed with you, that getting proteins across the ER is accessible to any protein that has a signal sequence. You can, make, you can take a, a, 
a bacterial protein and, and put a signal sequence on it, and it gets, goes across uh, the endoplasmic reticulum of the, um, of the eukaryotic membrane. So it is, it is that ticket that you need, and the rest of the protein doesn't matter. Unless you have a sequence which opens the channel laterally, which is seen by the channel, and then you become an integral membrane protein. So this is one of the systems that I have discussed, namely the endoplasmic reticulum, but there are many other systems because there are many other compartments to which you have to send proteins. You have to understand that proteins only live for a, a day or a couple of days, and some of them live only hours. And so they have to constantly be, have to be resynthesized. The cells live much longer. The proteins have to constantly be resynthesized. And actually, when they're slightly damaged, they're not repaired, like DNA. When DNA is damaged, there's a repair system to, to repair the DNA. But with proteins, they, there is no repair system. There are little machines which take a damaged protein and, and, and swallow it. it. They look really like little dragons. They swallow it, and they spit out the amino acids, and the amino acids are being used again. So there is a constant turnover of these proteins. So these targeting processes have to go on all the time. This is also true for membrane proteins. So you have to constantly make the membranes new. You have to make your mitochondria new. Everything has to be constantly renewed. Um, and so the other system that I want to briefly discuss is how things get in and out of the nucleus. I briefly mentioned it to you. And I, I, I will tell you why this is very important. Incidentally, before I leave the endoplasmic reticulum, I'll tell you what people may say, well, what is, what is important about that? Uh, uh, why, why, is this, uh, why did the Stockholm bother to, you know, to, to give a, a prize for that? I don't know why they bothered. But um, in, in, uh, the... the it is, it is what it has had great industrial use. There are now proteins produced in the United States alone worth $5 billion. That erythropoietin is one of them, which is a secretory protein which has signal sequences attached and use this mechanism to get out of bacteria. And therefore, you can purify them very easily. Then, of course, there are many diseases where this process of targeting doesn't work. Imagine the receptor that Ed Fisher was discussing this morning. If you have uh, some problems with properly integrating the protein into the membrane, the, you will not have a functional receptor. So uh, there, there are many diseases, and more and more are discovered, uh, where, where individual targeting uh, uh, problems exist. Now, here is... Um, Proteins getting in and out of the nucleus. And the reason why this is so interesting, you have all heard about Dolly. Dolly is taking an egg cell, taking the nucleus out of the egg cell, They're taking all the genetic material out of the egg cell, except for that that is in mitochondria, and then fusing this enucleated egg cell with a highly differentiated cell of Dolly's uh, mother in this case. Um, that then brings in the nucleus of Dolly's mother into this enucleated egg cell. And what happens then, there is a dialogue between the egg cell cytoplasm and the nucleus of Dolly's mother's cell that has entered this cytoplasm, one million transport events per minute. And after 12 hours, of the Dolly mother nucleus in the cytoplasm, you have gone back in the chromatin organization of the DNA to that of a totipotent zygotic cell nucleus. And so this is really an incredible thing. It's an incredible finding. We, nobody ever suspected this would be possible. It had been done in frogs, and it can be done in very primitive organisms, but it, it wasn't, it, 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 nobody thought it would ever be possible in mammals. And Wilmot uh, this demonstrated this in this experiment. So what one can conclude is that the egg cytoplasm has all the goodies to reprogram a nucleus from a differentiated cell. The working hypothesis, if we talk about what can we do in the next 10 or 20 years, is with all the ethical problems that we have with egg cells, is that how about taking an ES cell, an embryonic stem cells, which we now can grow in culture, and hope that its cytoplasm, when you take out its nucleus, when fused with another nucleus from another differentiated cell of you or me, would then become a totipotent ES cell of me or of you, which would avoid all the ethic problems. We cannot make an embryo out of that. But we can potentially grow any tissue, cartilage, 
heart muscle, anything that we want from these cells, I mean, it will take a while until we understand how the ES cell differentiates. I mean, huge problems involved, I mean, trying to, not trying to, to simplify things. But we would essentially, if this principle, this concept works, that the cytoplasm of these cells has really the information to reprogram the nucleus. And the cytoplasm is a principle, the components in the cytoplasm are the principle determinants. How many they are, we don't know. It could be five components, <clears throat> excuse me, five components, it could be ten components, it could be a hundred components. But we have to find out what they are. So, we have to learn something about this traffic in and out of the nucleus. And this is um, a, a problem that we have worked on, and, and I wanted to briefly tell you where we are on that. And um, here you have these, maybe I go back, you have these so-called nuclear pore complexes, and they are huge structures. The protein conducting channel is a miserly little thing of uh, 220,000 um, Daltons in molecular weight. It's not very big. This structure is bigger than the ribosome. It's 25 times bigger than the ribosome. It's one of the biggest structures in the cell, consisting entirely of proteins. So this is called the nuclear pore complex, and all traffic in and out uh, goes through this nuclear pore complex. And unlike in the protein conducting channel in the ER, where the chain has to be going across through a very narrow gauge and has not, must not be unfolded, the, the, the uh, nuclear pore complex is more like a sewer pipe. Uh, it, it lets a lot of things through, but, but, it is very selective. And how it is selective is really the interesting thing. You have the same theme. You have signal sequences, you have signal recognition factors, but you have a completely different transport principle. And this is very much like sort of the Bach-Goldberg variations. It's a simple theme, signal sequences, recognition, targeting, translocation across a poor channel, whatever. But the variations of the scheme of, of this theme are really so exciting. I mean, I wish I would have time to talk about mitochondria and chloroplasts and peroxisomes. They are, in each case, the theme has been varied in the most fascinating ways. Not to talk about bacteria. Uh, we heard uh, from, from Edmund Fisher today that bacteria have, um, the Yersinia, the pest-causing bacteria, has a, on its plasmid coding for a phosphatase, which is a, really a eukaryotic protein, which the bacteria then um, secretes through a needle, which it polymerizes from one single protein. One single protein of the bacteria polymerizes a long needle with a narrow gauge, and this needle, while polymerized, punctures the eukaryotic cell and puts this protein that Edmund mentioned from the bacterial cytoplasm across three membranes, two bacterial membranes and the eukaryotic membranes, and injects it by this molecular syringe, a real nano device, if you like nanotechnology, injects it into the eukaryotic cell. This is just bacteria are the absolute masters in this, and we are very far from understanding things. But let's go back to the nuclear pore complex. So if you look at the nuclei by freeze fracturing, you see on the surface of the nuclear membrane, you see these pore complexes. They're actually very beautiful structures. You can see an eightfold symmetry. They look like flower structures. And here is um, an image that we have done uh, that um, shows you the pore complex. There is in the center, in pink here, this huge open pore. It's 25 nanometers when it is open. It's, for those of you who know the nanometer world, it's a very, very big opening. And then there are all of these uh, fibers and sp spokes and rings which connect this central tube to the membrane. It's a double membrane, there's a hole in the double membrane, and this whole structure of the nuclear pore complex is anchored in this structure. Now, so I'm going to rotate it for you a little bit so that you can see what it looks like. See, there are fibers here, and there's the center structure, and here are the two membranes, and if you cut some of the membranes away, you can see that there are, uh, uh, there's a nuclear basket, and, and there's fibers which point to the cytoplasm. And um, so you can see this, we have cut it away again, let me stop it here. So you can see the membranes have been cut away, right, and there is a circular opening in this double envelope membrane. In the center is this tube through which all the traffic goes, and here are these cytoplasmic fibers which go into the cytoplasm. And they are like the 
like the uh, tentacles of a jellyfish. They are roaming around, and if you have a signal sequence to go into the nucleus and the appropriate signal recognition factor, you can dock on these fibers. And so what happens is that substrates which have access to the nucleus are first concentrated there. And then by, by a, a process of probably uh, uh, diffusion, they go across this, uh, the channel. And there are these two structures which I come back, and blue is the, uh, the so-called nuclear basket, and here are these um, fibers which are, you find only on the cytoplasmic side, and blue you find fibrous baskets only on the nucleoplasmic side. And this is, um, Mike Routes lab has just been able to identify all 30 proteins by a proteomics project and, isol and, and localize them to the nuclear pore complex, but I won't go into this. Um, now, and I, go, I will be very short too, so a substrate, which is in, indicated here in pink, um, uh, will be recognized, its signal sequence will be recognized by a signal recognition factor. It will then dock here on one of these fibers, and then it will, it can go across, it can go in either direction, forward or back, and then um, it binds with high affinity to one of these blue fibers there, and then there is a small GTPase which dissociates, and this makes it possibly irreversible. And when you export something, it's just the opposite. You assemble um, something which contains an export signal with um, a, a transport factor and uh, with the small GTPase you dock and then you diffuse across to the other side and then GTP hydrolysis gets you into the cytoplasm. I mean, it's a very quickly summarized what has been worked out in the last five years or so in, in one minute. Uh, but it doesn't really matter whether you understand uh, these uh, th principles in great detail. Just let me show you another little cartoon which made a sort of a take-home message what this would look like. Um, trying to get the little hand here um, into the picture to wait until it comes. Oh, here it comes. So now you have the membrane, the outer membrane, the inner membrane of the nucleus. Here are these, the central pore is not shown here. Here are just the fibers on the cytoplasmic side and on the nucleoplasmic side. And what we imagine is that these fibers move, right? And so what you now see is, is the movement of these fibers. And it now comes a hapless protein along, which doesn't have a nuclear localization signal, and it just doesn't get there because the fibers entropically exclude it. Now comes a, a substrate which has a, which has a transport factor, and it can bind to the fibers. It goes across docks here, and then comes a small GTPase, which dissociates, and it can go in. I mean, so this is a very different mechanism than you have seen for the translocation of an unfolded chain across the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, and I have just one more, two more slides, and then we are, we are free. Now, here is um, a picture that has been done some time ago by, by uh, Ron Lasky's lab in England, in Cambridge. And what he has done is he has taken gold particles. These, these round particles are gold particles, and he has coupled them to a nuclear protein that has a nuclear localization signal. And then he injected this into the ooplasm of an oocyte, and this is an electron micrograph, and the preservation of structure is not very good. But you can see the nuclear envelope here, and here's a pore complex, here's a pore complex, here's one, and here's one. And you can see then how these gold particles dock on these fibers in the cytoplasm. You can see how many there are. We have calculated there are sites for more than 500 docking sites on these fibers, so that you have really a zone that concentrates your substrates that wants to go into the nucleus first before you actually go into the nucleus. And then you, go, you can see that they go single file, this is now the other side, they go single file across the nuclear pore complex into the interior of the nucleus. And what has been found is that there are actually filaments which extend from these nuclear baskets of the nuclear pore complex into the interior and they branch and they form some sort of intranuclear subway network because the nucleus is very crowded, I already told you, two meters of DNA in 23 in 46 pieces in our case. And, and so it's very crowded and so you, you have to create a subway system that you can go very, very quickly by diffusion and you're not hindered. And these fibers create a chromatin-free space in which this very rapid transport can occur to the center of the nucleus. And recently we have been able to isolate this. Uh, here I just wanted to show you, um, you look 
by an electron micrograph from Hans Ries, you look at the interior of a nuclear envelope and you see one pore complex here, another one here, um, and you see the nuclear basket, these nuclear basket fibers. And here these filaments, these branching filaments have been ruptured off. You see just a little blob here, you see a little blob here. But here you can see they have been, they have not been ruptured off. And you can see how they how they anastomose and how they branch. And they go all the way to the interior of the nucleus and they create this chromatin-free zone for this intranuclear subway. And, and this, of course, is there must be entries and exits. And so this is a new uh, research area, very fascinating. And here we have isolated these fibers. You can see they, uh, of course, they have aggregated on the grid. And so they are, uh, we are just in the beginning to analyze them. But what is already stunning, that these fibers are made from a large number of alternatively spliced forms, messenger RNAs of the same gene. And what we expect is as you expand the chromatin, you have like in a Lego set, you have proteins which have shorter or longer uh, fibrous portions, and they can then uh, interact with the chromatin surface of the expanded chromatin, and then can create this chromatin free space uh, on which you can then build other molecules. Of course, there are many other molecules which interact to allow facilitated diffusion. So I have given you in this, in this too long lecture a, um, a short overview of how exciting the field of protein traffic war and how, how is and it still is, we are very far away from understanding it, and what the practical implications are. Now remember, if we would understand what goes in and out of the nucleus, in the case of Dolly, if we would be able to isolate the molecules, we could essentially make ES cells from any of you. I mean, there's a few other things you would have to engineer, and we could essentially grow any tissue uh, that we need to replace in you. We couldn't make an embryo, so we would, we would avoid all the ethical questions which, which have plagued us uh, over a very long time, and we would avoid, we would sidestep them. And, uh, and this would give us, of course, a tremendous uh, potential to repair many, many diseases by cell therapy. We wouldn't have immune rejection. Uh, it, it, would, it would really be a wonderful thing. And, and it will take a long time until we find out, but it, it um, is one of the applications of studying uh, communication between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Well, I mean, the really key advance was the crystallization of the, uh, the Ecola ribosome, yeah, Archaea ribosome. But you know, look, I don't know what the comment is here. It's right. Uh, Dr. Norby will be joining us soon. I have a question for Dr. Blobel to begin with here. If the data that you're showing us is unpublished, does that mean that it won't be on the test? <laughs> No, it will be published uh, in one month in two papers in Cell. But one thing that I wanted to add, particularly for the young people, I wanted to give you the feeling how much there is to be done. Just mention, think of the example of Dolly. Uh, we have to understand what are the factors, are five or ten or fifteen, how far we have to go, and um, I hope that many of you will join us in this fun. It's a tremendous amount of fun. You can see I'm still excited uh, about these things, even so they happened 25 years ago, because they are beautiful constructs, and uh, so you will be compensated by low pay, but by a high degree of high of excitement. <laughs> Let me begin with uh, asking for comments from the panel. Uh, anyone? Dr. Maddox? In another context, Einstein said, God does not play dice. Um, in this case, it seems that you've been saying, nature leaves nothing to chance. Inside the cell, what the impression you gave me, Everything that's produced is guided to the place where it's needed by some inbuilt mechanism. Is there any room, for, uh, therefore, for talking about diffusion, should we say, in a cell as the product of mass action? I, mean, I exaggerate in what I said at the beginning, but really, what is the balance between guided placement of proteins and well, sheer diffusion? Ultimately, in the case of nuclear transport, it will be mass action, but it, it, the diffusion will be facilitated because on these filaments sit a number of uh, nucleoporins um, that uh, are not only in the nucleopore complex, that serve as docking sites. And uh, these nucleoporins can interact with transport factors. You have bigger leaps than you have getting uh, through the Dardanelles of, uh, or the uh, Straits of Sicily, that, that is really what the nuclear pro complex is, but then you have um, uh, facilitated diffusion also within this uh, chromatin-free zone that is delineated by these fibers, uh, we think. I mean, we don't have any proof yet. There could be other fibers that, involve, that are involved, but um, we think it's only those fibers. Okay. Uh, Dr. Croto. What's the structure of this syringe that you described as a nanotech? Oh, that. <laughs> what, what's, what's the. Th the little syringe that Yersinia has made has probably the most. Dead, has been the deadliest weapon ever assembled in, in, in history because it has killed more, far more people than, uh, than the AIDS virus. And this little syringe is, a pro is, is made of a protein that is 6,000 in molecular weight. And it can, it is polymerized in the inner membrane of the Yersinia bacteria and then goes through a channel in the outer membrane and is polymerized, uh, we don't know how, into a spiral kind of, uh, of, of uh, syringe with a very narrow gauge, I don't know what it is, uh, panangstrom, not more than that. Uh, and, and so the protein that goes across must be unfolded. How, the, how this uh, phosphatase that you mentioned is then unfolded and is selected to go across, we don't understand. But it is, it, it, we have published it. You can see it in, in PNAS that the syringe is absolutely magnificent because you can see it in negative staining. You can see these beautiful needles and you can see the center of the needle, of course, empty because that's where the protein would go across. So it's a nano, it's a nano syringe, if you wish. Dr. Fisher. Uh, Gunther, any idea how uh, axons go to their 
target in the brain? Do they follow actin corridors, uh, type of subways like you, you mentioned in the nucleus? Any idea about that? Because they go, you know, centimeters. Yeah, well, but that will be probably, the question was how, how do axon and dendrites connect with each other? I talked of about 10,000 connections of each neuron in the brain. Um, some of them have more, some of them have less. And how do they find each other? The numbers are staggering. I think it's 300,000 synapses per second yeah. that are formed. So if you have a child, 300,000 synapses per second, when it sees something, it has to integrate all of this information by connecting the, prop, the nerve cells with each other. And so what happens exactly, uh, you know, there is very simple models one can propose that these are integral membrane proteins that are highly localized in, a, in the dendritic portion of the plasma membrane and then uh, via this uh, concentration there uh, and again mass, some sort of mass action uh, um, and, and then of course there are factors that have been isolated and so on and so on. I'm, I'm really not working in this field and I don't want to trivialize it. I mean it's, it's, there's a tremendous amount of work going on where there are gradients of, of, of soluble proteins which help then yeah. in, in attracting uh, uh, and the formation of neurons. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the panel here? Yeah. I have a question here. If the body rapidly catabolizes proteins, what is the functional lifetime of therapeutic proteins? Well, um, what I was talking about are proteins in the cell. And um, in this cell, there is a magnificent looking machine, which really looks like a dragon called the proteasome. And this proteasome eats damaged proteins. And the proteins are first marked for destruction by putting a little ubiquitin molecule, which is another short protein to it. And uh, this is a very important discovery because protein degradation plays such an important role in cell, in cell control. I, I, I don't want to go into that. but so. These are machines which have been developed for intracellular degradation. Now, proteins which you get give from the outside, they can be endocytosed, and then they can be um, uh, degraded in the lysosome. For instance, we heard uh, from Prusiner today that uh, if you stimulate perhaps endocytosis, that these proteins, uh, the prion proteins, may have a better chance of being degraded in the lysosome. Perhaps, I mean, maybe that's one of the... Uh, um, consequences of this, but um, it, it depends um, um, uh, how, not how the intracellular machinery can degrade it, but this machinery that is there in the lysosome, in the endosomes, that degrade or that are on the surface of the, of the cells, membrane proteases on the surface of the cell, or that are secreted, how resistant are these proteins? And erythropoietin, for instance, is not, is not uh, li lifetime, I don't know, probably a day or two, mm. something like this, half-life, half-life. So you have to inject these proteins over and over again. There's another one from the audience here. Is there a way to attach a signal tail to a protein without one so that it can enter the nucleus? Yes, you can genetically engineer any protein that you want, and you can put the right signal on it. And if you do that, the protein will will go where the signal leads it to. So people have taken proteins and got them into mitochondria or into chloroplasts or into the nucleus or make, uh, make a cytosolic protein into a secretory proteins. So people have done this. So you can, you can essentially do cell engineering if you, if you uh, want to do that. OK, here's another technical one for you. With reference to the dual membrane of the mitochondria, how can a single stop transfer signal be read and integrated into the intermembrane after that same signal was ignored by the previous translocon of the outer membrane? Now that's a very uh, interesting question which has not been solved yet. I would imagine that the channel in the outer membrane reads a little different than the channel in the inner membrane. Okay. But uh, there is not that much information yet. We have to be patient. Here's, here's one little, little less technical. How did you develop so much enthusiasm for your subject? <laughs> um, I've always been very curious, and um, I've always liked to, to, 
to make working hypotheses, and I've done quite a few of them, which were killed by ugly facts. Um, uh, and uh, that, that has never discouraged me. And um, it's, it's, it's nice to have a working hypothesis, and then if it fails, well, you say, well, this is just another uh, hypothesis killed by ugly facts. But if, it, if you succeed, it gives you a very wonderful satisfaction that cannot be surpassed by anything else, at least in my case. Right. One more technical question here. It says, inhaled proteins are readily absorbed through the lung. Does the lung have a protein conducting channel, which is analogous to the ribosomal system? Which, sorry, which lung? Uh, this is... Inhaled proteins are readily absorbed through the lung. Well, the lung epithelium may not be... Uh, may not be totally um, closed all the time. And this is why when you, the connections may, may be leaky and this, this is the way it would get across. I mean, this would be my explanation, but there are more uh, people probably in the audience who can answer this question better. I'm not a lung epithelium, uh, epithelium specialist. Okay, well, another question here. What aspects of proteomics do you see that might be most useful for practicing physicians in the coming years? Well, I mean, there is a very interesting thing. People are looking at proteins in the urine. And um, they are very sensitive machines now. The, the new spectrophotometers uh, can detect atom moles, which is um, almost, um, we are not yet at Avogadro's number of single molecules, but we are coming very close. And so it's, it's worse to look at urine again. And in, uh, urine is, of course, uh, uh, the kidney is a filter, and many proteins, almost all proteins, get across, and then they are reabsorbed. And uh, so the urine is a wonderful diagnostic tool. And, going from the early physicians who dipped their finger into the urine and put it on their tongue to see whether there was diabetes, whether there was sugar in the urine. We have gone a long way, and it is worthwhile to look at the urine. I was just at a biotech company meeting where people are actually looking at the urine. And it's amazing uh, the number of proteins that you can see and that you can actually use it for diagnostic purposes. And that will be a, a huge new frontier where you can just take a drop of urine and you can, uh, you can uh, tell what... Because each disease has its own um, uh, footprint, leaves its own footprint in the blood and leaves its own footprint in the urine eventually. And if you have highly sensitive matters, you know, with just a drop of urine, you can tell that's what you have. Okay, do we have any other questions from the panel? One closing question here from somebody who remembered Dr. Croto's talk from yesterday. Uh, did you have a Meccano set when you were a kid? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I, was, uh, not, I was not one bit interested. I mean, I would totally contradict, uh, um, Harry, what you said. I, I have, was not one bit. I was only interested in architecture. Maybe, I mean, I, I wandered through this beautiful old medieval city that I was privileged to grow up, Freiburg near Dresden, which was a complete intact medieval city with, with city walls and, and magnificent Gothic and Renaissance buildings. And I choose my, my, my way through the city each time to see another building, another street. And I would go in these buildings and look, and I was very romantic and I was very impractical. I couldn't, my father said, you are so impractical, you only can be a lawyer. You cannot put, you cannot put a nail in the wall, but you can argue for hours. <laughs> so there wasn't, I haven't really played with machines, but on the other hand, I didn't become a physicist and I didn't become a chemist. And I think there it's probably much more required, right? It's just this guy to fix your car. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, speaking of that, who was the architect? Was it Palladio? Because it has the solidity and the Greek features of a Palladio, your, your Dresden church. No, the Dresden church was built by, by George George Beer. Who, and it was built between 1723 and 1742. And it was inspired by the Italian, uh, by Santa Maria della Salute in Venice. Even so, Bear had never been there. When August the Strong of Saxony traveled to Italy, he, uh, he said, you know, I must have in Dresden a cupola church. And of course, you know, once he de demanded that, you know, the architects immediately went to work and built this, and Georg Beer built this cupola church, but he didn't, didn't want to build a cupola church just like any other church. So he built a cupola 100 meters high, you have to imagine, in form of a bell. So it is called the stone bell or the steinerne Glocke. 
And this is what the absolute unique thing of the Frauenkirche is. It's the only church which has a stone bell, a stein and a glock. And when it is finished, it will be one of the ten world oneness again. And this is why we are all very enthusiastic about it. Isn't that interesting amongst our panelists here, our Nobel Prize winners, we have a musician, a graphic artist, an architect, and a poet down in the end. <laughs> Let's uh, thank our panel for some absolutely wonderful discussions that we've had. We'll reconvene at 6.30 this evening. <laughs>